The patient assessment system consists of several steps, but always starts with the scene size up. The scene size up uh, happens before we ever approach our patient and allows us to ascertain what sort of resources we may need, how we can protect ourselves, both physically and environmentally, and gives us an idea of what we're heading into. It happens before we actually make contact with our patient as we approach the scene, even before we get out of our vehicle. We'll talk about primary survey, sample history, that ongoing or secondary assessment, how we obtain baseline vital signs, and our ongoing assessment and reassessment in later videos. So the scene size up consists of several parts to help us enter scenes safely and prudently. Body substance isolation allows us to protect ourselves from any fluids that may be coming out of our patient. Scene safety allows us to look and investigate pieces of the scene, whether it's the physicality of the scene or things in the scene, how our patient is responding that could affect our safety as responders. We'll assess the mechanism of injury with our trauma patients or how they got hurt, or the nature of illness with our medical patients, how many patients that we have, any additional resources we may require based on our assessment of number of patients and the mechanism of injury, and spinal considerations. Do we need to take into account that this patient may have a spinal injury, usually due to that mechanism of injury? So let's look at body substance isolation. A great way to think about this is if it's warm and wet and not yours, don't touch it. What are we isolating from us? Well, fluids for one, and fluids could take a variety of forms. It can be coming from any part of the patient's body and oftentimes in ways where the patient isn't even aware of it. So body substance isolation always starts with at least a pair of gloves. We don't enter any scene in our profession without the minimum of a pair of gloves on. We don't wanna get into an assessment, touch something warm and wet that's not ours, and then realize we should have had gloves on to start with. So blood, vomit, urine, sweat, tears, bile, feces, semen, vaginal fluids, body substance isolation takes into account that any of these could be carrying pathogens and we don't want those pathogens in our own bodies. We protect ourselves, that body substance isolation with our personal protective equipment. A minimum of paramedical gloves. We may be wearing safety glasses or goggles, possibly even a face shield. Surgical masks are often used, especially with our respiratory patients. And if we're concerned about aerosolized secretions, so people coughing where those tiny little droplets hang in the air for a little bit, we may have to have a fitted N95 mask or something similar. N95 masks are a very specific piece of equipment that you need to be fit tested to to make sure that they are actually protecting you from aerosolization. If we're doing CPR, we have various devices that keep pathogens from transferring from one person to another, whether it be a face shield or a breathing mask or the like. And gowns are often used in places where we may have contact precautions. Maybe our patient has a skin condition called MRSA, we may consider a gown, or if there's going to be a lot of splashing of bodily substances. Somebody's projectile vomiting, we may want to consider a gown. So some other scenarios, think about our trauma patients often have blood that we don't want to come in contact with. If we get called to a respiratory distress patient, having our mucous membranes covered with the masks and some sort of eye protection is a prudent consideration. Things like emergency childbirth in the field tends to be very messy, so we're going to have eye protection, mouth protection gloves and gowns as well. Let's look at scene safety. Scene safety is often underlooked in our profession and given today's climate, we need to take a closer look at how we are assessing scene safety for ourselves and our crews. A quick look through any of the news reports these days shows how EMS and fire crews have come in danger, have come in crossfire, and sometimes are even targeted. 
in our local area just last year, a fire crew responded in an engine to a house fire. And as they pulled the engine up to the site, shots were fired upon their engine and they had to take cover. As it turned out, the gentleman who started the fire in his house did so to draw the EMS crews to his house to shoot at them. Last year also in an area of Wisconsin, fire EMS and police were called to an unconscious patient on a bus. When they revived this patient with Narcan, the patient became combative and drew a gun and ended up shooting and killing the firefighter and ended up in a gunfight with the police officers. These are some examples of scenes that did not look dangerous from the outset, but became dangerous as the scene progressed. And there are situations that we need to keep in mind when we respond on any call that we're dispatched to. Approach the scene with the idea of how could this scene potentially harm myself and my crew and how can I mitigate those risks? So what can make a scene unsafe? There's some obvious things that can make a scene unsafe, such as traffic if we're called to a motor vehicle accident. How are we protecting that scene against oncoming traffic and protecting our crews from being hit? Down power lines. We don't approach scenes with down power lines until we get the power company involved. If there's smoke or fire, domestic violence, maybe it's a crime scene. All these things are more on the obvious side that we need to take in consideration, but there's less obvious pieces that can make a scene unsafe as well. So what sort of surfaces are we walking in on? Is there somebody hiding in the back room? Is there broken glass? Is it dark? Let's turn those lights on. If there's lots of boxes crowding the hallway, maybe we need to move some things around or get our patient to come outside where we have better access and we have a better escape exit. If we've been called to a suicide, there may be firearms at the scene or other methods. And if there's family members or loved ones on scene in their grief, they could potentially become a safety hazard for us. The ramifications of not adequately assessing the scene could be severe. So taking that extra time as we pull up to the scene, what does the house look like? How well is the yard tended? Is there a barking dog out on the back deck? Is the dog secured? Is there a barking dog inside the building? We do not need to put our own safety in jeopardy if it's unwarranted and we can wait for additional resources to help make that scene safe so we can still provide patient care without becoming a patient ourselves. The mechanism of injury or the nature of illness depends on what sort of patient that we're responding to. We tend to think of mechanism of injury as our trauma patients and the nature of illness as our medical patients, although the two can come hand in hand. Let's focus for a moment on our trauma patients and what it tells us by trying to ascertain that mechanism of injury as we approach the scene, maybe from our call notes, from our dispatch, or from what we see as we drive up. It can give us better information as to what sort of resources and equipment that we need to respond and to care for the patient and how many personnel we actually need on that scene. Somebody falling off a ladder from picking apples it requires different resources and equipment and personnel than a three car accident on the freeway. There's also a lot more force involved in that three car accident on the freeway than there was on with somebody falling off that ladder from picking apples. So how many resources do we need? What sort of injury patterns we, may we be suspecting? And ultimately, that mechanism of injury gives us an idea as to how much force was involved in the accident and whether or not we need to consider if this patient could have a spine injury. The next piece of our scene size up is ascertaining the number of patients we have. Often this is very obvious, but it is something that can also be overlooked. Take for an example, a motor vehicle accident that involves three cars one driver is hurt in the car, the passenger door is open, two other cars are empty, and there's five people walking around. Well, how many people were actually involved in that motor vehicle accident? 
Are some of those people walking around bystanders or were they in the cars? Were they belted or not? So how many patients do I actually have? Do I just have one driver or do I have six total patients? Consider another example of a motorcycle accident with a driver lying next to the bike. Was the driver the only passenger on that motorcycle or did they have a passenger that was ejected? Depending on our topography, there's tall grass or heavily treed area, or maybe an embankment, we may have trouble locating that passenger if they exist. This can also come into play if we have multiple patients that are very loud. Maybe they're screaming, they're calling for help, and it's very obvious who the patients are. Keep in mind, there may be a patient that is unable to scream or cry for help that is also hidden from view and we need to ascertain where that patient is and if they exist. All of these pieces of our scene size up, our scene safety, our mechanism injury, and the number of patients clue in to how many resources do we need to manage this scene. So if it's a motor vehicle accident, we may need to have police on scene to help with traffic and fire for extrication. If it's a house fire, we'll definitely need fire as well. If it's a chemical spill or there's odors in the air, we may need hazmat to get the scene safe. And depending on the level of our patient's injuries, if we are only a BLS unit or basic life support at working as EMTs, we may need to call an advanced life support or paramedic unit in order to provide patients the care that they need. So considering that mechanism of injury or our nature of illness, how many patients we have, and the safety of the scene, we may need other resources to help us out. The last piece of our scene size up gets back to those spinal considerations. Our mechanism of injury and how much force was involved in our patient's accident. If it's a high energy mechanism, say a car accident, maybe a car versus pedestrian or a car versus bike, or fall from a great height. Maybe they had a direct blow of the neck or head. Maybe they didn't fall very far, but they hit their head on concrete or were hit in the head by a baseball bat. If they have any sort of altered level of consciousness or an injury that is so painful, they can't tell you if they're hurting anywhere else or they can't even tell you what happened. We may need to consider protecting that spine from further injury. If we are suspecting a potential spine injury, how we approach our patient can exacerbate or lessen further injury. Try to approach the patient from the feet or from the front where they don't have to turn or move in order to look at you. So those are the pieces of our scene size up, things that we're thinking about and preparing ourselves and our crews for before we ever approach that patient.